Um, it is my pleasure to invite uh, today an excellent uh, and upcoming uh, 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 cognitive cardiologist from uh, the Harvard Med School. Uh, his name is Dr. Vadagunathan, or you can call him, I guess, Mutu for short. Um, and uh, he's a cardiologist at Brigham and Women's and then on faculty at uh, Harvard Medical School. He received his MD and an MPH from Northwestern and subsequently completed his residency training in internal medicine at Mass General, followed by fellowship in cardiology uh, at the Brigham and Women's. So he's board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, but more importantly, he is a true scientist and historian where he looks at um, you know, the evolution of medications. And one field that's ripe for that um, really is anyone who's observed the medical treatment of advanced heart failure, um, it never ceases to amaze that every two or three or four years, another advanced, just a medication comes along, which further reduces mortality when used correctly and judiciously. So to take us through that journey, we have today, Dr. Mutu Vadaganathan. Dr. Vadaganathan, the floor is yours and you can start screen sharing um, if you have your slides. Wonderful. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, excellent. So um, I greatly appreciate the very generous uh, introduction as well as invitation. And it is um, wonderful to see um, um, uh, some uh, familiar names and faces uh, in this group. And, um, and so I, I hope to take you through kind of over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, the evolution of MR antagonism uh, as it relates to cardiovascular and kidney protection. And many of you may be wondering, well, why is this guy in 2021 talking about MRAs when we've, of course, of course had these drugs around for really decades? Um, so I hope to convey some of the new and upcoming evidence as well as newer therapies in this space um, uh, to guide your own practice. So as, as you know, chronic illness uh, in, in the United States and worldwide has now converged and is highly overlapping in which substantial patient populations with, for instance, chronic kidney disease have concomitant heart failure, type two diabetes, atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases. And while we've traditionally in drug development considered these in silo, we've developed therapies specifically for chronic kidney disease, specifically for heart failure, and type two diabetes, et cetera, ideally uh, individual drugs targeting multiple disease pathways may actually allow for not only um, uh, uh, smaller drug regimens, but also potentially more effective uh, therapies. And in fact, aldosterone has really emerged over the last several decades as a key determinant of cardiovascular and kidney health. And while we often measure aldosterone as a means to detect, for instance, secondary or rare forms, seemingly rare forms of hypertension. In fact, in the community, uh, biochemically overt aldosteronism appears to actually be much more common. In this recent cross-sectional analysis of about four centers in the United States of over 1,000 patients who underwent an oral sodium suppression test, the proportion of patients who had biochemically overt um, aldosterone, uh, aldosteronism was actually about over 10%, even in those who are normal tensive. And as you had stepwise increases in blood pressure, there was a greater proportion of patients that had elevated um, aldosterone activity. And in fact, I particularly liked the conclusion of, of uh, this article. They, they mentioned that the prevalence of primary aldosteronism is high and largely unrecognized. Um, and there's a prevalent continuum of renin-independent aldosterone produ production that parallels the severity of hypertension. And most importantly, these findings redefine that primary aldosteronism syndrome and implicate its pathogenesis in truly essential hypertension. So that is to say, is hyperaldosteronism or aldosterone excess states actually more prevalent and may underlie multiple disease states? In addition, we've learned over the last several decades that foundational therapy, that is guideline-directed medical therapy that is thought to 
of um, uh, change the disease course of these chronic conditions now uh, are highly overlapping. Here in 2021 on the left-hand panel is what we consider quadruple therapy or best practices for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, on the right hand is for chronic kidney disease, so-called triple therapy or uh, inclusive of a renin-angiotensin system inhibitor, an MR antagonist, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. And in fact, you can see that these are highly overlapping with MRAs or MR antagonists as a central component to both uh, uh, disease management uh, um, regimens. So why is um, the MR antagonism so fundamental to heart and kidney health? Um, and it's really been a, a very historic journey. Even in the 1940s, it was broadly recognized that MR antagonism was a, uh, was, uh, sorry, MRAs were, were important in blood pressure management and that the MR axis was an important determinant of systemic blood pressures. But in the um, mid to late 1940s, it was further recognized that actually the MR was important for other pathways, including fibrosis and inflammation. And in fact, elegant animal models in which a uh, DOCA, which is an MR activator, uh, was shown to cause rapid deterioration in these animal models, especially when exposed to excess blood pressures um, and, and, and high salt diets. And, it then carries forward, and this slide kind of lays out the historic pathway of the MRA development of these therapies. And you can see that um, we've had stepwise trials as well as developments in this space, including newer therapies that are more targeted to block the MR receptor um, that takes us up to the contemporary era. So I'll take you through some of those trials that many of them may be well familiar to you. Um, the first are the seminal trials that established the MRAs as foundational therapy in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This was first studied in the early 2000s in the RALS trial, which was really quite sick individuals with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with marked um, uh, uh, deficits in terms of left ventricular uh, systolic function and showed a, a really impressive result with spironolactone with an improvement in overall survival. This was later followed by a trial called Ephesus, which was an, a trial of post-MILV dysfunction, including some of those individuals who'd already made the transition to heart failure. And again, there was an important benefit, including a reduction in sudden cardiac death. Um, more recently, the Emphasis heart failure trial extended these findings to patients with more mild or lower functional class uh, heart failure, and again showed an important benefit with a plerinon, another steroidal MRA. So taken together, these findings have now worked their way into clinical practice guidelines and MR antagonists or class one recommendations for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, both in the United States, Europe, and worldwide. These were next studied in heart failure with higher ejection fractions, including those with preserved EF. Uh, in the TOPCAT trial. This was a trial, a global trial of about six countries. And on, on average, um, at the global scale, the trial was about neutral and did not missed its primary endpoint in showing benefits of spironolactone. But there were important regional heterogeneity, such that in the United States, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, the Americas, there was actually an important benefit with respect to uh, spironolactone in this population. And this actually worked its way into US heart failure guidelines and is now recommended as a consideration for those with heart failure preserved EF um, uh, who are similar to those who, who met criteria for this trial. Furthermore, the FDA is currently considering uh, broader expanding uh, uh, the labeling for spironolactone uh, for heart failure preserved ejection fraction. That labeling is pending. Um, so we've talked about spironolactone and a plerinone, and these are two steroidal MR, uh, uh, MR antagonists. Spironolactone is, was the original compound. It's, of course, generic and quite uh, widely available and cheap. Um, it is highly potent in, in antagonizing the MR receptor, but unfortunately it has low uh, selectivity and it, it actually inhibits other um, androgen receptors. So often has other side effects, including uh, sexual side effects like gynecomastia. In addition, it has multiple active metabolites um, that may also have downstream off-target effects. 
Um, furthermore, its selectivity is more so selective to the kidney rather than the heart, which gives rise to higher rates of hyperkalemia. Um, the next in development was a plerinone. This is another steroidal MRA, but has a, a bit less potency, but was is actually a bit more selective in terms of uh, antagonizing the MR receptor with a bit more uh, selectivity for the heart. And so um, uh, given the increased selectivity, this therapy has less sexual side effects, including gynecomastia. And more recently, and what we'll talk about for uh, some time is a drug called finerenone. And this is the first non-steroidal MRA, so different biochemical structure that is both highly potent and highly selective for the MR, and in fact has much more balanced tissue distribution in the heart and kidneys, and so has uh, theoretically lower risks of hyperkalemia. So this uh, foundational evidence up until about a decade ago um, uh, was uh, was well established, but really MR, uh, MRAs have, have been incompletely adopted in clinical practice, even in appropriately targeted patients. So why is that? Um, in fact, hyperkalemia is really the Achilles heel of MR antagonism and makes it challenging to apply to broad populations. And so this therapy, finerenone, which is a non-steroidal MR antagonist, was really developed for the explicit purposes to be more tolerable with respect to potassium risks. And this is a bulky compound um, uh, that's both selective and potent to the MR receptor and is distinct in structure um, uh, and so may have different uh, biochemical properties when applied in practice. Um, so we discussed that combination medical therapy is really foundational now in heart failure and chronic kidney disease. And for instance, this is really because these therapies may target non-overlapping pathways. For instance, in chronic kidney disease, the renin angiotensin system inhibitors control hemodynamics. Seemingly, the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors have metabolic glycemic benefits. Um, and the MR and, uh, MRAs really target in this inflammatory fibrosis axis that may be important for CKD progression. The, uh, the, uh, this finerone compound has now been studied in over 13,000 patients in chronic kidney disease in two seminal uh, uh, clinical trials. Um, and they really, uh, this is the KDGO heat map that many of you may be familiar with on the uh, uh, y-axis is EGFR categories that um, make up stages of chronic kidney disease. And on the x-axis is um, albuminuria status, previously known as micro and macro albuminuria, now relabeled as A1, A2, A3, based on increasing albumin in the urine. Um, and the bottom right-hand corner is our sickest individuals of greatest risk for progression to end-stage kidney disease or requiring renal replacement therapy. So here is um, the first trial, which is Fidelio, Figaro, um, and uh, the, the composite, which is they, they called Fidelity. But you can see these patients were at relatively high risk for progression. These are patients who have established albuminuric diabetic nephropathy. And so they, they generally have some impairment in EGFR and they have uh, uh, um, albumin that is, uh, is quite present in the urine. Uh, Finerenone on the addition of maximally tolerated ACE inhibitors and ARBs, 100% of individuals were on these therapies, showed an important reduction in progression to end-stage kidney disease. Um, and in fact, the benefits were seen uh, on, across many of the uh, composite or component uh, endpoints that make up this, um, this uh, uh, composite endpoint, including one that um, you may be um, uh, perhaps is most important to patients, including end-stage kidney disease, which is uh, requiring dialysis or transplantation for renal replacement therapy. Um, so this is really the, the, the overall result of those two trials. There was about a 23% relative risk reduction an absolute risk reduction of about 2% over three years. So there was a bit about a number needed to treat about 50 to 60 to prevent one important kidney event. Um, and interestingly, finerenone in this population also improved cardiovascular events, including major adverse cardiovascular um, uh, events in, in addition to these kidney endpoints. Um, thankfully, this, this uh, newer therapy was well tolerated. It had modest blood pressure lowering, about 
three points or so at a year um, compared to placebo. It had really no clinically relevant um, glycemic or weight changes. Um, there were no effects on acute uh, kidney injury, um, and there were no uh, important sexual side effects, unlike uh, spironolactone. So what are some of the practical things you might start to see? Uh, Finerenone, based on these data, have now been, uh, has now been FDA approved as of uh, a couple of months ago for broader use, and so you may start to see this in practice. Um, in general, these, uh, this therapy comes in uh, two doses, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, um, based on the starting EGFR. Unlike the steroidal MRAs, um, you can check potassium four weeks after initiation, since there's um, le uh, slightly less uh, risks of hyperkalemia, and we'll review that in just a second. So after that four-week potassium check, you can titrate the uh, uh, compound to the maximally tolerated uh, dose, which is 20 milligrams, based on the potassium level. So some of the practical uh, aspects of use um, uh, that uh, in for the MRAs in general, especially in our sicker patients with heart failure, um, uh, even progressive heart failure. So the first is that these therapies really have this kind of interesting titratable property in which at high blood pressures, you can see it in yellow, for instance, above 130, 140, they're actually quite effective blood pressure lowering therapies. And in fact, trials have shown that in, in, in patients with resi drug resistant hypertension, their uh, MRAs are a very nice add-on therapy, perhaps because those patients are selected with excess aldosterone activity. In contrast though, in those individuals who have low blood pressures, even less than 100, they're about hemodynamically neutral. They have very limited blood pressure effects. And it, um, in, in fact, um, most individuals with heart failure, even those with advanced heart failure, are likely able to tolerate low doses of MR antagonists without an appreciable blood pressure effect. The second is an important aspect with respect to their, their um, interaction with EGFR. We have probably, uh, many of you have probably seen that um, EGFR expectedly declines um, or has this EGFR dip after we initiate, for instance, a renin-angiotensin system inhibitor, such as an ACE inhibitor or ARB. A very similar dip is seen with the SGLT2 inhibitors that can be seen within days or weeks of initiation. And the exact same EGFR dip is seen with the MRAs. And these are data from two of the pivotal trials in heart failure. And you can see that within days of initiation, there is a decline in orange in EGFR. Um, and then EGFR stabilizes over time. This, for each of these drug classes, this is a expected hemodynamic effect at the level of the glomerulus. Uh, this is a, a reduction in glomerular hypertension and thought to actually be one of the mechanisms by which these drugs help uh, slow um, chronic kidney disease progression over time, especially in models of diabetic kidney disease. And so this, uh, importantly, a early reduction in EGFR or a rise in creatinine should not be a reason to discontinue therapy uh, prematurely. And that goes for the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, the MR and, uh, MRAs, as well, as well as the SGLT2 inhibitors. So um, to spend a couple of minutes on hyperkalemia, um, hyperkalemia has really caught the public eye with respect to these therapies um, and has limited broader use of the steroidal MRAs. Um, after the initial release of the RALS trial, which was the first uh, uh, large-scale trial of an MR antagonist in a, in a chronic disease population. Um, uh, these are data on the left-hand panel from Canada in which they, they saw a rapid increase in clinically relevant hyperkalemia events, including hospitalizations. Um, and unfortunately, that then um, really slowed uh, use and, and, and appropriately introduced caution in clinical practice about their use. Thankfully, we've seen less of uh, um, uh, those changes with more recent trials. For instance, after release of TopCat in, uh, in orange here, you can see that really the rates of hyperkalemia hospitalization in a Medicare population has not really changed after broader use of uh, spironolactone in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So perhaps people are becoming more mindful people are becoming more uh, aware and attentive of hyperkalemia. And of course, we've also had advancements in 
potassium lowering therapies that may be effective here. So with finerenone, there is a slight um, increase in, in uh, serum sodium as expected um, with, uh, with the use of finerenone compared to placebo. This occurs very early after initiation. Um, and in fact, if you take any hyperkalemia, let's say above 5.5, you do see about doubling in rates of hyperkalemia. But in contrast, you see very low rates of, of ones that are clinically relevant, those that land people in the hospital, cause other, um, uh, other issues, including arrhythmias or even deaths related to hyperkalemia. Um, and uh, expectedly, these hyperkalemia events were seen more likely in those with high baseline potassium levels and those with poor, um, have more advanced chronic kidney disease at baseline. And so those are the patients that we, we should be monitoring more closely. Um, and uh, just to reinforce, unlike uh, guide guidelines for spironolactone and clarinone, which recommend uh, um, uh, FDA labeling, as well as uh, clinical practice guidelines recommend checking a potassium level within a week or two weeks of initiation. You have a longer time frame for finerenone because of um, uh, some lower risks of hyperkalemia. You can check it after a month of therapy, and, and that may allow for more feasible use in clinical practice. So head-to-head, -head, uh, we have unfortunately limited data for these generic and more recent therapies. We have some therapy, uh, some data from phase two programs of finerenone compared with spironolactone or plerinone. And in fact, uh, these trials, um, the initial, for instance, ARCH trial in the top panel did show against spironolactone, there were lower risks of um, uh, potassium elevations in addition um, compared with the plerinone, it was about the same, but there were other benefits that were seen um, with finerenone compared with the plerinone. So maybe that there's some net benefits of using um, uh, this newer compound if affordable and accessible to patients. Um, so the final aspects I want to touch on is, you know, is about the practicality of combination therapy. And many of these conditions, we see patients either in the hospital or in the ambulatory care setting for short periods of time can we actually effectively combine them um, in a both safe and effective manner? And in fact, um, the pivotal trials show that certainly whatever the patient was on at baseline, whether they were on a low-dose beta blocker, low-dose ACE inhibitor, they still appeared to benefit to a robust degree with the addition of an MRA in heart failure. And um, here, for instance, are data from emphasis heart failure. Even in those individuals who are at low um, target doses of ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, they still seem to benefit from the addition of the clarinone. Um, and so com early combination therapy is the strong uh, clinical practice recommendation. And in fact, is adopted now in the ESC 2021 guidelines for heart failure. In addition, there may be nice synergistic potential between these therapies. Often we think of, um, especially in heart failure, we have a finite blood pressure to work with. We have finite kidney function, finite electrolytes, and adding on therapies often detract from, the, from those finite um, so-called spending function. Um, but in fact, we see that when combined, they may actually have synergistic potential with respect to these side effects. So these are data from a trial called DAPA heart failure, which is a trial of an SGLT2 inhibitor, dapagliflozin, in, in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And in fact, in those individuals who were on an MRA at baseline, there were lower risks of hyperkalemia when these two are combined. And so um, the addition of the SGLT2 inhibitor to an MRA lowered the risks of hyperkalemia and may actually allow for treatment persistence in practice. Same exact finding has been seen with the combination of an MR antagonist and um, uh, secubitril valsartan and angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. So these are data from Paradigm Heart Failure, the pivotal trial that established secubitril valsartan as a class one recommendation. You can see in the hollow circles, there are lower uh, um, potassium levels compared with an ACE inhibitor in those who are on an MRA at baseline. And in fact, uh, um, uh, more recent data suggests that this actually allows for MRAs to be uh, continued in clinical practice to a greater degree in those on combination therapy, 
And in blue here, you have the rates of discontinuation of the MRA over time in patients treated with uh, secutra valsartan. In red is ACE inhibitors. And you can see that when combined, uh, an MRA is combined with an uh, um, secutra valsartan, there is lower rates of discontinuation of the MRA. So you can use these effectively in, in practice and may actually promote use of MRAs over time. So this is just the beginning. We're learning a lot more about the MR antagonist in heart failure and chronic kidney disease. In fact, there are three randomized clinical trials, uh, the first three panels here of MRAs in heart failure that are still underway. Um, these are all in heart failure with preserved and mildly reduced ejection fraction um, uh, with EFs above or equal to 40%. Um, there are two trials of spironolactone, spirit and spirit. Unfortunately, they're uh, less creative with naming uh, or running out of names in cardiology, but these trials are hoping to validate findings, those exploratory findings seen in the TopCat trial um, and are anticipated to report out in the next couple of years. There's a larger trial called Fine Arts um, that is a trial of finerenone in heart failure with preserved and mildly reduced ejection fraction. That will report out in 2024. And finally, in chronic kidney disease, they um, established two pivotal trials, Figaro and Fidel uh, uh, um, Fidelia were, were, were conducted in diabetic kidney disease. Um, now a uh, similar modest sized trial is undergoing in non-diabetic CKD called fine CKD. Um, and so just to mention, there are trials trying to explicitly studying these combinations of an MRA and an SGLT2 inhibitor to validate those findings that in fact, they can be safely combined and there are lower risks of hyperkalemia. This, for instance, is a, uh, a modest sized trial of about 500 people in which a MR, novel MRA is being con combined with an SGLT2 inhibitor at various doses, um, including uh, and when studied alone. Um, and furthermore, this is just one other trial. It's a little bit different design in which they're rotating the therapies, but again, studying a surrogate endpoint of albuminuria reduction, um, but also studying safety, blood pressure, tolerability of the combination. So, you know, since the, you know, the historic uh, um, introduction of the MRAs, we've seen increasing use in clinical practice. Um, this is just the MRAs as background therapy in our randomized clinical trials in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. You can see in the first era, really in decade four now of heart failure trials, but in the first decade, uh, use was relatively low. Um, in the second decade, it was more modest, 30 to 60%. And consistently now in randomized clinical trials, even in global settings, uh, MRAs are now being used in about 70 to 80% of individuals with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. In addition, we've seen increasing use of the MRAs in, in those with heart failure preserved EF. And you, you may recognize um, in your own practice, especially in the United States, uh, that MRAs are used quite often in people with HEFPEF um, or uh, mildly reduced ejection fraction. And we're seeing that reflected in uh, clinical trials background therapy. Um, there is more real world or, or sort of usual care data that also supports increasing use. Um, uh, in red here, you can see that there's been a slow but modest increase in, in use of MRAs in hospitalized people with heart failure preserved DF. Um, I'll just skip over these. Just one, one aspect uh, that I'll, I'll drive home and, and then I hope to open up um, for questions and, and, and a discussion here. So the MRAs are particularly challenging to continue and, and partially that's because of random fluctuations in potassium and kidney function uh, during treatment. And you can see that um, even in short-term follow-up, um, uh, with median follow-up of, let's say, let, about half a year or a year, you can see that only about 40% of people end up staying on therapy with persistent use, um, whereas uh, another 40% may actually discontinue therapy. And we've seen this time and time again with uh, um, clinical practice data that the MRAs of, of the therapies in combination use 
for CKD and heart failure are most commonly discontinued. And so management and monitoring of hyperkalemia utilizing safer agents really does show promise in improving treatment persistence and practice. Um, so I will conclude there. Uh, the MR receptor um, uh, overactivation is a central driver for progression of heart and kidney disease. The steroidal MRAs, that's spironolactone and plerinone, for the backbone of therapy for heart failure to reduce ejection fraction, but certainly do potentiate hyperkalemia. The non-steroidal MRAs that have now been developed, approved for use, um, uh, including finerenone, slows kidney disease progression and actually lowers rates of cardiovascular events in chronic kidney disease in the presence of type 2 diabetes and may have uh, lower risks of hyperkalemia. Um, these therapies can be really easily combined with other effective therapies in heart failure and chronic kidney disease management and ongoing trials, um, uh, including three evaluating the MRAs in HEFPEF, and in addition, non-diabetic CKD are underway. So I think we'll learn uh, a substantial uh, more about these therapies as they're integrated into practice. So um, I'd love to kind of open the floor to any questions that you may have. Um, it's uh, really wonderful to see a lot of uh, familiar names in the audience as well, and I appreciate you all joining. Um, and uh, most importantly, I think, I, I hope I convinced you that, you know, MRAs, while have been around for decades. Um, there has been a lot of evolution and progress, um, especially in making them safer and uh, more applicable, hopefully, to your own practice. Uh, th th thank you for a wonderful presentation, a lot of data. I know that um, my, my field has sees a lot of patients with right ventricular failure, and that's a really challenging group. To, they have the poorest responses. But actually, um, I was laughed at by cardiologists for using spironolactone in the 70s. So what led to the resurgence of interest? Because it's a very old drug. My patients like it because they don't, they don't have to worry about the potassium so much uh, as supplementing in their diet as opposed to standard diuretics. So that's really been an important part. So what I'd like to know whether any of the studies combine diet control along with medications to manage the potential hyperkalemia. And the other thing I wondered is whether you've correlated the results with quality of life and symptom control separate from mortality or hospitalization, because the bottom line is patients tend to be compliant when they do better and feel better. No, it's, uh, these are wonderful questions. And I think I, I too have found benefits um, in using these therapies in patients with predominantly right um, RV dysfunction as well. Um, the, you know, the, to answer your questions, you had a few there. I, I can start with quality of life. Each of these trials did measure quality of life, um, especially the heart failure trials. And there are important improvements, both in reduced and preserved EF, um, improvements in quality of life in addition to um, uh, other aspects of health status, like mortality, keeping people out of the hospital. So, um, you know, these are probably modest benefits when, when stacked up against some of the other therapies in heart failure. Um, I would say I've seen much more, um, uh, perhaps more pronounced uh, health status improvement with uh, some of the other therapies like Secutral Valsartan, um, in which people may more immediately or early on in therapy feel better. But each of these components have shown actually improvements in health-related quality of life. Um, the interaction between diet and, and what we recommend in terms of diet is an interesting one. And uh, you know, until now, there haven't been really well-conducted trials of or studies of um, sodium potassium management in heart failure. There are some now underway. And so um, how they interact with medications will be quite interesting. Um, I'll mention also that you know, our understanding of potassium regulation has also evolved such that there are now effective therapies to lower potassium. Um, uh, you know, they're not commonly used in, in why, you know, general populations because it's yet another medication or another therapy that a person needs to take to perhaps facilitate use of these therapies. But um, they, uh, there are studies now underway to understand can we use those, for instance, potassium lowering therapies to facilitate use of, of, of the MRAs and the renin angiotensin system inhibitors uh, alongside other measures like diet control? So 
Um, I think we're going to learn learn more uh, in uh, in in the kind of coming years. But there's been a certainly a resurgence of interest, mostly because the um, uh, I think the trials have been uh, you know very definitive in showing um, improvements in multiple aspects of health in heart failure and and CKD. Thank you. Now, when you look at uh, foods in the marketplace, they have a sodium content, but they don't have potassium content or magnesium content. So what is the impact of these agents on magnesium levels as well, which can obviously contribute to uh, electron electrolyte imbalance in, in chronic diuretic use? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I don't believe they have a meaningful impact on magnesium. I, I may be mistaken, but I, I, um, I am, um, not something that uh, uh, I, I personally haven't seen seen data on on um, magnesium fluctuation. I fully agree that our labeling should be more transparent and 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 um, patient and public uh, public friendly. And and in fact, I had seen some int recent guidance from the FDA that they have at least for sodium labeling that they're making progress and making things more transparent, um, especially for our high risk patients. I think that'll be quite helpful. Do you think we'll ever get labels with a big red mark with a slash through it when the sodium level exceeds 300 milligrams per serving? I mean, all the snack foods are very high in sodium and uh, most people aren't even aware of it. So, you know, I don't need any salt in my food. And of course they're eating all this junk, uh, which is amazing. I mean, one of these days I'm going to take a video of shopping carts in supermarkets to show you what people are choosing to do. Uh, so I, I fully agree. And it is, uh, and we know, uh, especially from, um, from this particular axis, the MR axis, both animal and early human models fully suggest that the MR, um, MR activation is more deleterious when exposed to high sodium. Um, right, levels. right, right. And so this is really is, um, I, I, I fully agree with you uh, in terms of using these um, strategies in combination is going to be very important. Yeah, thank, thank you. Anybody have any more questions? The beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions kind of even after the um, after the talk, I'm happy to put my um, email, direct email address um, in the uh, chat room so that folks can um, reach out with any questions um, about this or um, heart failure or chronic kidney disease management in general. But um, it's, uh, it's an exciting kind of time in terms of uh, uh, evolution of therapies and, and how they're going to be used in practice. I particularly find it fascinating that um, I, I wouldn't have foreseen that chronic kidney disease is pretty much going to be managed almost identically to heart failure in mm -hmm. 2021 and beyond, um, aside from a beta blocker. And so that I think is a important reminder that probably the drivers for these chronic disease states are actually more similar than different. Um, and that while the paths of, of how these were developed, tested were distinct and, and ran kind of in parallel or in sequence, they ultimately landed on, on very similar evidence-based therapies for these um, chronic diseases, so. Can you put up your email again? I didn't get the whole thing. Oh yeah. It is. Um, it's, it's a M long last name. Yeah, M and then my last name at, at bwh.harvard.edu. H.harvard.edu. Thank you so much for such an awesome talk. And yeah. I wonder, particularly with your last comment about the uh, the co the interdependence of all these different uh, disease processes, particularly the chronic disease processes with uh, chronic kidney disease and heart failure, and all the um, overlap in the comorbidities that coexist. Our understanding of how we're managing these patients and how we we add more quality to their to their uh, years that we're extending uh, is only going to get better. What in your mind is going to be the new 
um, sort of paradigm shift in how we're managing comorbidities uh, collectively in a multidisciplinary fashion. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's it's a it's a wonderful question, and I think that these these entities, while um, you know, are are one liners in, in in practice, often detail them kind of separately, and um, um, they they probably overlap to a much higher degree than we fully appreciate. For instance, a hospitalized heart failure patient taken, um, if you look in the United States, with um, uh, with uh, sensitive screening with uh, cystatin and urine albumin levels, upwards of uh, nearly three fourths of them may have concomitant um, some degree of chronic kidney disease. Similarly, if you routinely screen with A1Cs um, uh, for uh, type two diabetes, upwards of 40 to 50% may actually have concomitant diabetes. So they overlap substantially. So I think the next phase, um, um, you know, Drug development and heart failure is likely, in many ways, um, has reached a, a peak. And so I think the next phase is really going to be about implementation of combination therapies. And so much like we've moved that in that direction for, let's say, HIV management, where there's effective combinations um, and uh, um, care is kind of individualized about which, which combination is needed based on the individual's profile. I think that's where heart failure and CKD management will move as well. And um, so it'll move towards more about identifying folks uh, kind of prospectively who are living in the community and um, will need, of course, buy-in from clinicians and patients that in someone who's otherwise feeling well, let's say with early CKD, should you take three drugs um, uh, to slow CKD progression? That may be a feature that um, most people with an EGFR of, let's say, 55, they may not be willing to take multiple therapies um, um, for the re remainder of their lives um, to, to slow CKD progression. So that will require a little bit of a paradigm shift. But I do think that these therapies, um, combination medical therapies, will be the norm, and that implementation of these therapies will be the next phase of how we will um, uh, need to really tackle population level health in, in delaying CKD progression and delaying heart failure progression. Such a great point. And as a follow-up question, um, how do we uh, educate patients to buy into, hey, we're gonna be delaying the onset of a disease process, or we're going to, uh, it's very, very hard to ensure compliance with a single medication, let alone uh, multiple drugs. And then advocating for combination therapies when they're feeling fine, uh, but biologically we know that they're not. So we don't have super sensitive biomarkers to be able to track and show people that this makes a difference. So what are your thoughts on how can, how can we ensure that uh, this public health approach is adopted by our patients? Yeah, that, that is an, another wonderful question. Um, that messaging is gonna be critical. The, the, um, you're absolutely right in terms of, we don't have ready biomarkers or um, uh, imaging necessarily that are gonna track perfectly with the response. Um, things that I think are, have, I've found helpful, we do know that um, uh, while these trials, for instance, in heart failure on average were conducted over about two to three years, um, we do have modeling that uh, suggests that um, if these were continued for lifetime use, what is the um, anticipated benefits of combination therapy? So if you take an average patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, um, we had estimated, for instance, in a 55-year-old, um, who is on um, the most common regimen worldwide, which is an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, um, if you fully optimize them to what's now guideline recommended, a four-drug therapy with Secutra Valsartan, an SGLT2 inhibitor, an MR antagonist, and a beta blocker, what would be the added um, gains in terms of overall lifespan, overall averted clinical events? And in fact, um, four drugs, um, our, our best available therapies compared with more limited therapies afford up to about six years of added um, uh, life years for an individual. So I think some of that type of data that's more tangible, that these drugs really, 
you know, especially in heart failure, I don't think that there's really any other disease state um, that we've seen such rapid improvement in, in therapies that really change disease course um, um, for, for chronic illness. And so that is, um, that's something I, I emphasize that th this is um, um, uh, really um, new information that um, uh, can positively influence their lives. Um, for CKD, it's a little bit more challenging, you know, the, the data for mortality benefits are there, but they're a little bit less robust. Um, and so there it's really progression to end stage kidney disease or needing dialysis. And that is not a predictable trajectory by any means, um, but in, a, in, in probably the most uh, clean model of, or well-defined model of, of kidney disease, chronic kidney disease is diabetic kidney disease. And there, there is a steady stepwise, almost linear decline in EGFR that can be um, projected. And, and that visually can be quite helpful to see. Um, albuminuria is an absolute um, um, uh, underutilized tool. Um, albuminuria responds very effectively to each of these therapies and reduction in albuminuria, we know also uh, tracks with improvements in downstream kidney outcomes. So that's something that I, you know, I think can also visually be shown to patients. Um, and then finally, the combination therapy that the similar estimates of what I mentioned in terms of overall survival, um, you can, we, we have now, uh, and, and these will soon be published, uh, estimates around survival free from um, uh, needing dialysis. And so that's another endpoint that, for instance, a, a, a a person with kidney disease may want to know how long can I survive without um, needing uh, or going on uh, dialysis or needing a, a kidney transplant. And in fact, that is very substantial. And in an average patient, even with moderate to high risk CKD, um, advanced stage CKD, it can be delayed by up to 10 years. And so um, this is um, uh, where we've kind of entered a new era of medical therapy, but communicating it to the public is going to be of, of high, high uh, priority. Fantastic comments. And using all of those visuals and those graphics and those numbers in a shared decision-making model, so patients have a say in what kinds of therapies they will want to adhere to. Um, and I wonder, as digital medicine continues to evolve and the um, that feedback that you get from variables as you're getting better, that may also tie into some of that decision-making and selection and who's going to be right for what kind of therapy. Uh, really excellent, excellent points. Uh, any other questions from our audience? Sorry, Umesh had to jump off for another call. So uh, just stepping in for him. Uh, and if there are no other questions, uh, we could give some people uh, time back in their day. and. Um, Thank you, thank you again for a fantastic presentation. Lots to think about. And obviously uh, we, we hope that we can bring you back once there's more data on how to use uh, some of these exciting combination therapies to slow down chronic disease progress. Wonderful, I, I really appreciate you in, in inviting me and uh, thank you all for joining in this afternoon hour. Um, and please do reach out uh, and be in touch if you have any questions or uh, to catch up. I certainly uh, see many friends in the audience, so I appreciate you joining. Thank you. Thank you.